Jack, you, you were uh, instrumental in the uh, ski marathon, weren't you? Uh, yes, uh, one, one of the, the founders. Uh, it is an interesting story. I mean, I'm the recreation director in Westfield at that time. Uh, would have been uh, 1978. I get a call out of the blue from the lieutenant governor's office. I, I have to tell you, I don't usually get calls from the lieutenant governor's office in Westfield. I was relatively new to the job there. Totally caught me off guard. She, this woman's name is Ann Burrell. She's an assistant to Marianne Krupsack, who was the lieutenant governor then. And uh, she starts out by saying, well, I was in a meeting with Don Hogan, at that point the director of the, the Visitors Bureau here, and a tireless promoter of the county. And um, I knew something was coming as soon as I heard Don's name. And Don and I knew each other. And she said, we were talking about the fact that there are ski marathons in several places in the, in the country, and they're great draws for, for communities at an off time. Uh, if they're largely <laughs> summer communities, this is, draws people in, and, and it's great for community sport and so on and so forth. And Don said that Chautauqua County would host one, and he said, you would chair it. <laughs> that's so, Don, yeah. And that, yeah, and any of you knew Don, that, that's not un, unusual. So, uh, so it turned out that uh, I, for some reason I said yes. I checked with some uh, friends and colleagues in Westfield, ended up being largely driven by uh, some friends in the Westfield Naval Rotary Club, actually. And uh, we ran it for 11 years. From, uh, the first one was in the, in the winter of 79. At one point, we drew 1,300 entrants from, uh, I think we missed two states over the years. I don't think we ever had a skier from Nevada or something in Hawaii. But, uh, uh, and also a half dozen foreign countries. The first winter, so we're really smart. We're, we're going to have something really unusual for the first event. And we say, okay, we're going to bring the winner back. We figure we're bringing it back from Pittsburgh or, or from Cleveland or from <laughs> Vermont. <coughs> First winner, Per Jacobson from Norway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was an exchange student at Lancaster High, 17-year-old, incredible skier. And, and we were not about to go back on our words, so we, we brought him back. We raised the money and we paid his, we paid his airfare, brought him back, put him up. Uh, he stayed with one of our volunteers. and uh, It was an amazing... Uh, example of a, a purely volunteer event. Mm -hmm. We formed our own private nonprofit corporation. Uh, we had officers uh, involved. 300 volunteers on the day of the event. Something like nine or ten volunteer fire companies. Two or three levels of uh, law enforcement. Uh, Forty porta johns. Uh, you know, <laughs> the, 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 the logistics were really incredible, and, and none of us. None of us knew anything about it when we started, but it became the largest ski marathon uh, east of the Mississippi. And you started, the first couple of years, you were in Panama, right? Yeah, we started at Panama Rocks, right. and then we shifted to a, a bigger field down on a farm uh, and climber that actually took the course down a, an unplowed road. We actually skied into Pennsylvania, very few people knew that, because the road just sort of looped into Pennsylvania. There are no signs, no border guards, but, uh, <laughs> but you, you did ski into Pennsylvania, and then ended up at the uh, Snowmobile Club, because the Snowmobile Club was a key ally. And one of, the, one of the more interesting developments of the whole event was that we, skiers and snowmobilers aren't necessarily two common, common audiences. And, uh, for the event, they were. Uh, we, we worked together on trail access and grooming and, and common concerns about being outdoors and enjoying, enjoying this area. So, yeah, I still get people walk up to me in Chautauqua, tap me on the shoulder and say, you don't know who I am, but I know you. Uh, I skied in the marathon in 81, and I'm telling you, I finished. You know, <laughs> And it, 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 I, I actually, I just got a letter from uh, a woman in Minnesota whose son skied when he was 16, and he's now obviously in his whatever, uh, 50s, late 50s, and, uh, and he's, he's skiing another marathon, and he wanted information about how he finished. I don't, <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> this is the honest answer about this. But yeah, it was, great. it was a great time. Well, when you started Panama Rocks, our, my parents own property contiguous to Panama Rock. So you'd come down the uh, uh, pull the road yep. and uh, the balloons and all this stuff. So it blew away our... And, and Jeff Follinsby and I uh, skied at one of the first ones. And there's a movie of my mother took of us skiing, which is great, and seeing us at the very end of this marathon. 
which we finished. We can say we finished. You got still have your gold medal? We, yeah. It, but we, you could see Jeff and I walking. My mother's watching us as we're coming. It wasn't even a walk. It was a painful a trudge. one step at a time because we were painfully out of It was 34 seat. miles. It was a long yeah. And we didn't have many ideal conditions over the years. We had a lot of days that were pretty darn challenging. I can remember taking people off. We had school buses positioned at checkpoints, and we, we were monitoring people's safety and, and well-being along the way. But the wind chill was so bad coming across one field that we had people who were literally snow blind and frostbite. They were wandering 50, 75 yards off the trail, and we were literally walking out into this field and grabbing them and trying to guide them back and sticking them on a bus to get them back. That was one of the first years. We had a lot of, we had a lot of challenging times. And some great personal interest stories about the person that had overcome a particular illness or uh, three generations skiing, four generations one year, incredibly. Uh, those are great stories. That's why we did it. It, it was the, so much like Chautauqua. It was a people thing. Yeah. It was a people thing. It was an event, but it was a people thing. Uh, how many times did you spend a lot of time at the Palestra in Franklin Field? <laughs> yes, I love the Palestra in Franklin Field. Yeah, I went to I went to University of Pennsylvania. Uh, little little known fact, um, I, I doubt that anyone in this room knows what my major was in college, and I'm willing to expose it here. Okay, um, I was a religious philosophy major, actually, great liberal arts major. I was I was leaning towards sociology. Uh, but there were 400 or 600 majors at Penn that were taking sociology. You wouldn't get close to a, to a professor. And uh, the religion, they called it religious thought. That major had 13 majors, and there were 11 faculty. It was a great, great experience. And, uh, and, a, and a really uh, challenging liberal arts sort of presentation. And Penn was, was great. We lived in the Palestra for basketball. And Franklin Field for the Penn Relays. And the Eagles played there when I was there. So on, on Sundays, you dare not get out of the dorms because you'd get run over by it. They just poured through campus. Uh, that was, that was, those were fun years. Where was hometown? Where were you born? Uh, born in Kenmore. Uh, both my wife and I, I went to Kenmore West. She went to Kenmore East. Gave us uh, two proms to go to, two homecoming dances. It was really a good deal. Uh, <laughs> and we're still married. <laughs> so so that, that hasn't, hasn't hurt. Just ran into a, a classmate of mine again. It was the small stories. You ran into him here at Chadock with the golf course. Came walking in and had some archival photos because we're getting ready to celebrate our 100th anniversary up there. And, uh, and we were talking, and it turns out he's from Buffalo. And then the next thing I know, I said, Where are you from in Buffalo? He says, Kenmore. I said, Kenmore West, uh, which was, I, I knew by his age that it would have been Kenmore West. And, uh, and he said, yeah. And I said, what year? He graduated a year after me. It was a big school. I didn't know. Cool. Yeah. You, but, you need to tell everybody about your wife, too, because she has had a remarkable impact on this county. And Yeah, yeah. Uh, Diane started out, uh, I mean, the good news for us uh, it was that Diane was a nurse because we bought our farm, which is up on the Burdick Road outside of Hartfield, 40 years ago this June, actually. And uh, neither of us had jobs, one of the brighter things that, that we've done. Um, but it was a great piece of property, and, and we were moving from Philadelphia, having grown up in, in, in Buffalo, and we wanted a rural experience, a rural lifestyle. We didn't have kids at that point. And uh, we found this, this old farm, 50 acres and a house, and a fixer-upper, and, uh, and we bought it, and neither of us had jobs. So now what are you going to do? Well, luckily, Diane is a registered nurse. And... Uh, so she, she did some private duty nursing for a while, and then she caught on at Westfield Hospital. And uh, when our, our second child, our son Jake, was born, uh, when she went ready, was ready to go back to the hospital, she, uh, uh, she wasn't offered the same position. She was going to have to work some swing shifts again and some weekends. And she'd gotten used to being, having some time with the kids, obviously. And Dr. <coughs> uh, Robert Burke had just been invited to the county as county health commissioner and intended to set up a private family practice uh, as part of the arrangement to get him as a Canadian doctor. And uh, Bob met Di and uh, said, do you want to start this practice with me? And uh, it, at one point it was just the two of them and a part-time receptionist. And uh, the practice is now 30, 33 years old, hugely expanded. She is almost fully retired. She's trying to <laughs> finish up a few last things. And the other part of her nursing, which Charlie knows, knows well, is uh, she's also the Amish nurse because our farm is right in the middle 
of the Amish farms outside of Hartfield, outside of Mayville. And for many years, she and Bob delivered all the babies. Mm. Uh, and so she would, as every good nurse, do most of the work, and then the doctor would come and deliver the baby and go home, and I would stay around and, and, and finish up. But that's a very vivid memory for both of us, is of, it, it, they didn't have one stinking baby in the middle of the afternoon. Every one was at three or four in the morning. I mean, it was so consistent. And you'd hear this clop, 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 clop in the driveway as they pulled their, pulled their buggy in, and then you'd hear the whomp, whomp, whomp on the back door. And, and we knew because she'd been seeing the, the expectant mother uh, during the weeks before, and she'd trudge out there, and, and this earnest-looking man would peer in the, the door. He says, Diane, I think it's time. <laughs> you know, and, and Diane knew that it probably wasn't time, in fact, but that he was nervous. And she would dutifully get up, take her, take her black bag, and, and, uh, and go down and examine the mom, and, and oftentimes come back, try to get another hour of sleep before she said, I, I better go back down there. And, so she, I think she and Bob probably delivered, I don't know, over the course of the eight or ten years they were delivering babies, uh, they must have delivered 40 or wow. 50 babies. Some of the kids, of course, still live there, and we often ask how old you are uh, or how old they are because it gives us an idea that I actually was part of the delivery. So. Well, talk about the Amherst, Frank, a little bit. I, I'm not sure we all know that much. Uh, their, their schooling, their uh, uh, intercommunications, their... Obviously, the clop, 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 they didn't pick up a phone and say they had a problem. No, I'd say it, it, the, the Amish that live with us uh, and their farms surround ours now uh, are pretty much old order Amish. Uh, and, uh, and so they still don't have uh, uh, electricity, they don't have indoor plumbing, uh, um, uh, they don't, uh, uh, don't have cell phones. Now, there are a number of Amish, and many of them work on the grounds that you'll see with cell phones. and. Uh, those, our Amish would refer to them as Ohio Amish, and in fact, most of them do come from Ohio. This is, it, 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 did any of you remember the movie with Harrison Ford, you know, The Witness? Is that yes. what it's called? Okay. It, 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 maybe you remember this scene, because it's an in Amish joke. We, we, crack, we watch the movie every once in a while just to be the ones that know to laugh. Um, there's a scene when, when Harrison Ford, who's hiding out in an Amish farm in order to, to keep himself safe and, and protect an Amish witness, as I recall. He's, he's uh, uh, got the, the dress, the Amish dress, and he goes to town with some of the Amish men to go to the hardware store or whatever. And they ride their buggy in. And, and when they come out, there are a couple of young townies who are there, and they start taunting the young, uh, the young Amish man that uh, is one of the group that traveled with Harrison Ford. And, uh, and of course they're pushing him and, and trying to goad him into it, and he's he's being he's being uh, uh, peaceful. And Harrison Ford, of course, you can see is starting to steam. And uh, at a certain point, Harrison Ford leaps out of the buggy and decks the the townie. And and every everybody is totally aghast that this Amish man would would show this violence. And the old man sitting in the buggy does this, and he says. He's from Ohio. Because <laughs> they do have, there is definitely a, a certain uh, notion that the Ohio Amish are a little far out there. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, But yeah, I mean, they're, they're wonderful neighbors. We raised our barn uh, because I never took any payment for any of, any of these services. And, uh, uh, and so they always felt they owed us. They have a strong sense of barter and of, uh, of fairness in, in that. And, uh, and of course, I'm useless to them, so it was all die, you know, that, that, that build up our credits. But uh, we built our barn in one day, 50 by 20 yeah. foot barn. Um, uh, we showed up and there was a wonderful quilt on our bed that the women had come down and put on our bed while we were going to work one day. Uh, gorgeous china cabinet in the corner of our, of our kitchen. The, the oak trestle table that sits in our kitchen, I had ordered from an Amish carpenter down, down the road as a Christmas present for Di. I go there to pick it up two days before Christmas. He said, you know, I, he knew it was a Christmas present. I go, I said, Mose, uh, uh, you know, is my table ready? And, and he says, no, it's not ready. He said, Mose, <laughs> Christmas is the day after tomorrow. This is my Christmas present to die. And, and he gets a big grin on his face. And he takes the table, because I'm looking at it. It looks finished to me. He tips the table over. And he pulls a magic marker out of his po pocket, and on the bottom of the table, he scrawls, Merry Christmas from the Moe's Byler family. He gave it to me. Yeah. So I had ordered a second table, a little, little sort of uh, uh, 
drop leaf thing that would fit at the end of this table for only at Thanksgiving and bigger bigger events. And so, well, at least at least I'm paying you for that table. It's, you're not you're not getting away with this. And uh, he says, too late. He tipped that one over, and his father Wally had written. Merry Christmas from the Wally Byler family. So, you know, I mean, I had to confess to die that I hadn't paid a cent for Christmas <laughs> presents. But, uh, but that's I, I think those are those are pretty indicative of the sort of relationship we've we've had with the Amish. We feel very uh, uh, very fortunate to have understood a very different culture uh, and to have them as exceptionally good neighbors. Uh, it really, I mean, it, it always. There. I mean, when we travel now and we're we're gone for a while, we'll just mention to a couple of the Amish, keep an eye on the place, just uh, you know, just, and and a couple of the kids will do it. And when we've had projects, sometimes I've hired some of the the kids and paid them off with ice cream if I've got some some sort of simple grunt work that I know the kids would love to do and put out half gallons of ice cream on the front porch. And so yeah, it's uh, it, it's been a very a very good experience. Un uh, they showed up, uh, a quick Amish story, uh, they showed up scouting farms on, uh, in the fall of 76. For those of you who lived around here, you can see where this story is going. And we'd been there two years and they asked, uh, well, how are the winters <coughs> up here? Because we're up on the hill. And, uh, and we said, you know, first, we've been here a couple of years, and not bad. They do a good job of plowing us out. Well, that was the winter of the blizzards, and, and in January, they needed the National Guard to open up our road with front end loaders. Di actually rode down, she was still at the hospital, and Di rode the snow plow down uh, in order to get to work because they were so short staffed in Westfield. Um, uh, but the Amish never forget that. They, 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 there's still a few of them that were, they were around, and, and uh, it was actually this Mose and Wally that, that, that were asked that. And uh, uh, so, yeah, they, we'd get that, that hammered at us occasionally. He told us the winners weren't bad. So. You worked in Philadelphia after I got done with school, and what, what drew you here? Um, you know, we wanted to come back to Western New York. Uh, our family was in Buffalo. Uh, and. Uh, and we wanted this rural, this rural lifestyle, and frankly, we would have stayed, I think, outside of Philly had property been accessible to us. But Bucks County, Montgomery County, even then, was pretty pricey, and there's no way that, that we were, I mean, we'd saved everything we could. I had been working at University Hospital in, on Penn's campus, and, and I'd been working in a mental health agency, um, so neither of us were, were putting away a lot of money, but we'd saved up some. And, we lived in a house with four or five other friends of, of mine from college, so it cheap rent. But yeah, I think mostly we wanted to come back. We, we literally drew a circle in western New York of about an hour and a half from Buffalo, reasoning that that was close enough that we could have access to our family but not on top of them and they on us. Um, and that uh, proved to be brilliant, actually, because we, I mean, being able to settle here, being able to raise our kids here. Our property really defines us, and I, and I know, I mean, there's many people in this room that have known me for a long, long time, uh, but until you see where we live, that, there's a part of uh, in my life that you don't understand. It's a, it's a beautiful place up there, uh, and it's a very special place, and we felt it when we first saw it, and that's why we bought it. I mean, we literally bought it. We'd only, we never owned a house. We'd been living in apartments in Philly. We took all the money we had and put it, put it on the house. Without Why is it special? Describe it. Well, um, I think some places uh, speak to you with a with a, a, a sort of essence. It it is uh, it's beautiful to look at. It's we we live on on top of a hill, almost to the top of, of a ridge. Uh, we can see Lake Erie from our front porch. Uh, the woods is is interesting. It's not it's not a uh, sort of a plantation woods. It's very mixed. There's, there's a wonderful couple of creeks that go down. It's the sort of vision, you know, when we were thinking about wanting to buy a country place, you inevitably build up a, a, a sort of mental picture. Uh, this is what we want. And when you go to look at places, it, usually they don't fit. They say, oh, that house is sort of modern and clunky, or that property is really sort of boring, or that's too much open land, and, or there's no view, or it's too close to the road, or you, you end up we when we saw that place, I think it met that mental picture so well. And and to be honest, it wasn't the house; it was the land. We walked. In fact, the very first visit, we 
we walked all the way, it's about a half mile down to the creek in front of the house. Uh, it's a good sized piece of property, it's 50 acres, but it's narrow. It's f only 550 feet wide, so it's four fifths of a mile front to back. Mm -hmm. Both sides of the road, which is what we liked, we controlled our destiny. If we didn't do anything, we'd, we'd own that view. Uh, and by and large we do, except the trees have all grown up and I've had to cut a few down so I can see the lake. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I think that, I, I think it was just, it, it, it struck us as our, as the image of what we were looking for. It surprised us, it took our breath away. For 10 years you worked at Westfield. What was your Westfield? Almost 11. Yeah. Was the recreation coordinator, was that the first? first? Yeah, the first ever full-time recreation director there. They were having trouble with their uh, with their swimming pool, and the health department told them they weren't going to let them open it. It's an outdoor pool at Welch Field. And uh, so there was a, a, a volunteer recreation commission that, that uh, sort of ran the recreation programs for the village and the town of Westfield. And uh, they advertised for a part time position. I, I'd been working two years for, if, again, those of you who have been in the area for a while, the old Turner Lumber, which is where the, the snowmobile place is down here. Uh, well, here's a, here's a trivia question. Do you know who was a colleague of mine, this has been the mid-70s, 74 and 75, a colleague of mine, currently a full-time employee at Chautauqua, that all of you would know, but he, he and I worked together at Turner Lumber. We were the two staff members. Bill knows because Bill was one of our customers. That's how I first met Bill 40 years ago. And, and Wayne Verguth is his partner, and Carol. Al Aiken. And uh, a third member of the little little group uh, was Maritza Morgan's son, Kip, who runs the golf course, will run down, down the road. Uh, so there you go. I, I, it, was, it was an interesting sort of convergence of people that would find each other in other ways late, later in life. But yeah, you know, Westfield experience was great. It's a wonderful community. Uh, at a certain point after 10, 11 years, I think the village had to recognize that they weren't going to let me do much more. Mm -hmm. it, I, I, was, I, I had stretched them pretty far in terms of uh, uh, ambitions and, and developing programs and, and uh, uh, trying to enhance facilities. And, and it was a small community, and it's only 3,500 people or so. Um, but a wonderful town, and, and uh, uh, got involved with the Rotary Club there, which was also a, a real formative thing for me for about 20 years. So. How'd you end up here, Stockholm? Uh, Dick Reddington, actually, uh, who ended up hiring me. But Dick and I had met uh, through a, a state organization, the New York State Recreation and Park Society, which sort of represents the profession in the state. And uh, I had been very active in, in Western New York and actually helped found an affiliate part of that state organization called Southern Tier Recreation and Parks. And Dick, at that point, was the director of education, youth, and recreation. Uh, and he, he attended some meetings, we got talking, uh, he, was, he was raising sheep, I was raising goats. Uh, 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 we both had sports backgrounds, uh, it was, we, we instantly hit it off, so we, we became friends outside of our respective jobs. And then at a certain point he was in the middle of a transition in his office and a process that continues today with Chautauqua when somebody's leaving, there's always a, a chance to look at whether things could be reorganized in, in some way. And he had 17 department heads reporting to him when I, before I started, wow. uh, and obviously recognized that he couldn't pay a lot of attention to, to that many, uh, and, uh, and the youth and recreation part was something he could see being, being pulled out. And uh, when I started, actually, it was, it was quite different. I, at at Chautauqua, I, uh, I had the the existing youth and rec. So I had children's school, boys and girls club, uh, youth activities center. There was no college club then. Um, tennis, beaches, and sports club, six departments. And then I had special studies, which at that point was very small, uh, 100 and some courses, probably 65, 70 faculty. And, uh, and then I also handled capital budget for his, his, <laughs> his departments. Uh, and I also placed students in dorm rooms, which is, I, I never forgiven him actually for that. That was a, that was a, that was a crazy job, you know, which, which didn't have any connection to anything, but it was, a, it, he, he was trying to figure out how to get these things done with the available staff. And some of those things dropped by the wayside. But, uh, and then of course my job 
here at Chautauqua has just been one of, of constant change for 27 years. Uh, I mean, it's 12 departments that I was responsible for uh, before I retired uh, from most of them a couple of years ago, uh, from the six uh, whole things, the fitness center and, and uh, the sailing center and uh, uh, the golf course came to, to recreation, the college club was created, the young readers program, the family entertainment series all sort of emerged out of this, this greater community. Paint a picture for us in 1987 when you joined. What was your, what was your first of all? I maybe go back even further. What was your impression of Chautauqua Institution when you bought your place above Hartsfield? What did you know about this place? Yeah, to be honest, very little. Um, had not been a, a location that uh, either Dyes or my family had had visited. Any times we came to the Southern Tier, it was the Allegheny State Park. Uh, I don't believe I'd ever set foot on the place. Uh, until the the first before it was before I started, but it would have been was it eighty six the first Soviet uh, that that was probably my first visit to Shadok was was for that, uh, and my first impressions particularly of the youth and rec side was that it, it was a wreck. Uh, I mean, the, the boys and girls club was was just so in need. I mean, there, we were parking cars in the middle of the ball field. Mm -hmm. And the tennis courts, as you recall, it was cantilever down the hill, you know, and held up with with boards and stuff, and and uh, uh, and it was such a uh, such a wonderful historic program, but uh, but really needed to be rein reinvested in. And children's school, we collapsed one of the floors during a, a open house. That's how we got the children's school renovation, by the way, in '94. Mm -hmm. We had no choice. We had we had all these parents in one of the classrooms, and all of a sudden this creaking sound. And it sagged right. Luckily, there, there was only about 18 inches down to the to the ground, but the whole thing just literally sagged. And and uh, very quickly, donors stepped forward, as, as happens at Chautauqua. And we had a wonderfully renovated children's school. Still kept a lot of the flavor of the old the old place, but we dropped the ceilings for one thing, so it wasn't so intimidating to those kids with these high dark ceilings. You know, awful for little guys, but. Um, but yeah, it was uh, yeah, my my impression was there were there were lots of things for me to get involved with, and that's why I was being hired. I, mean, so I saw it as as the challenge being put in front of me. You saw that you saw the like, state of the condition of the Chautauqua facilities. Uh, did you have to deal with Charlie Hines at all about facilities? Well, yeah, I mean Charlie and I were talking talking briefly about how how fortunate we were to be part of so many projects. I don't think either of us could have envisioned that period of time. From what would you think? Uh, uh, well, I started in, in 93 when children's school and library were both wrapping up. Those are the right. first two projects that I was involved with. And my gosh, it's been. Yeah, off almost to ever the races. since. But I would say that 10 year period, let's say, between, yeah. between 93 and 2003. Um, well, 2008 or 9 with all of the. Well, uh, you know. uh, yeah. No, that's true. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it's been a constant ride. I don't think I ever imagined I would have a job that would involve so much work with uh, thinking about design and thinking about program function versus design and, and listening to, to architects talk about their vision and, and uh, beginning to learn about the bid process from Charlie and, and so on. Now, this is a, I have to admit, I, I, I can do that now because I'm mostly retired. Uh, I made up my job. I mean, I, I didn't come to the job in Westfield or the job in Chautauqua with a whole lot of direct experience in what I was being asked to do. What I had was that, that good, solid liberal arts education. I knew how to learn. And I was not afraid. In fact, I, I, I enjoy taking on that sort of challenge. So back in, in, in Westfield, I didn't know anything about fixing a swimming pool for Pete's sakes. I was out there with a jackhammer <laughs> the first summer I worked, digging up a, a leaking pipe. You know, the, the streets department guys got a kick out of it. They say, "Well, if you want it, you want it fixed, go fix it yourself." I mean, it was sort of the <laughs> new guy on the block, and and uh, I, yeah, I got the jackhammer and that they lent me, and I blasted away for a while and found this fitting that had separated, and we got it fixed and poured some. You know, I'm out there with a couple of bags of sacrete. I mean, it was it was primitive, but but that's the, I I've, I guess I've been fortunate to to be allowed to learn on the job and to apply you know things as you go along. Every time you do something, the sailing center. One of one one of the things I'm most proud of is that 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 Turney Sailing Center. Uh, A because of the relationship to the Turney family, which 
was uh, moving. I mean, I, I, they they took me in as part of their family, and and we you know we we established a certain emotional bond over seven years on that project. That didn't come about overnight. That was a seven-year process before that sailing center was built, and. Uh, but I didn't know a darn thing about sailing. I still don't. Um, well, I know more than I did that, I guess. But, it, but you don't have to know everything about everything in order to do a good job about advocating. You, you learn to find people you respect and, and who know more than you. And, and you have to admit, obviously, that they know more than you. And then you go from there. Um, we met before the sailing department was even founded. I met with a group of sailors every Sunday before church whole summer and it was really just to sort of conceive of what a sailing department would be at Chautauqua. I wasn't the one to, to design it but I was the one to try to put the pieces together. Um, so yeah, I've been, I've been very lucky to be part of all that. As an advocate, uh, you have to obviously deal with, as you being a part of, uh, donors and the administration. Uh, uh, certainly the impression is change comes slowly, deliberately at Chautauqua. Uh, talk there, to me there, from an inside of, uh, of the challenges and maybe the opportunities. Yeah, you know, you, the old joke, of course, at, at Chautauqua is how many Chautauquans does it take to change a light bulb? Change? Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, this place has changed, and, and I think uh, it, it's, it's really changed quite quite dramatically, but in, a, in an environment that's as old as Chautauqua is, you know, it's sort of a relative process. It, it, uh, if, we were, if we were 20 years old and you'd seen the things that had happened in the last 20 years, oh my God, the place is like, you know, it's this and then it was that, but it's 140 years old, and so it seems as if things don't change. But again, any of us that have been around for even 25, 30 years, see a tremendous amount of change in this place. Not all of it are things that we that we're fond of or uh, things should have happened. Uh, that's the way, I mean, that's, that's how change works. You're not, not happy. Heck, when we moved the tennis courts from, from the main gate to here, yeah, I was, I was vilified for more, over a year. I mean, people told me I was going to cause their heart attacks because they were going to have to trudge all the way up. I said, you're playing tennis, <laughs> you know. But it was an emotional tie, and I understood that. It still was the great opportunity to build an absolutely world-class tennis center by trading off the sale of some of those lots. We never would have been able to improve tennis here. I could never have recommended putting money into that old tennis center. Never. Uh, it was in the wrong place. But uh, but change was was difficult, and I, you know, I recognize that. There are people who literally cried over that transition uh, and still aren't happy that it moved, but, but I think they have to admit that it's a great tennis center. So. Was that the toughest thing? Um, that's probably the one that, that I, got, I, I got the most heat over. There, there were some very difficult days for me. It was that. nasty. It, it, was, it, got, yeah, it got nasty. Honest, it, was, it was really dirty and nasty. Yeah, it got Jack. nasty. Yeah, it was hard. Uh, and, and Dick and Charlie and, and Joe Johnson, who had, had been around battles before, uh, were really important at that point because uh, it was hard not to just say, you know, yeah, it, that was a hard. Yeah, that was a hard time. Uh, one of the one of the low lights, and yet I, I look back and I'm I'm proud of this whole thing. I mean, this campus with the tennis center, the the fitness center, and the and the natural <coughs> play space out there in, in the woods uh, won an award from the state. Uh, yeah, I'm proud of that. Uh, it's it's good. Yeah. It's very good. Yeah, uh, we have people still coming here to see it. The tennis courts themselves individually got a, a National Tennis Court Builders Award. So uh, it, it was right, but it was, it, it, was, it was nasty. It was hard. So that was a proactive, constructive thing that happened here. Was there things that, uh, as you reflect back on, gosh, I wish I could have been a better advocate to get something done that I actually didn't get through? Well, yeah, I, you know, especially now looking at it, um, I, I wish I'd have been more successful in, uh, in helping others in the administration or the board to to see the need for recreation to be included in the same way that other program areas are in terms of endowment, in terms of philanthropy. Uh, in general, the recreation side, not the youth side certainly is, 
but in general the recreation side doesn't have the underpinning that I think is it would be so helpful to keeping our investment strong. I mean, to be good stewards of all this investment that we've made in, I mean, look at the, the tennis center, the improvements of the golf course, and and uh, and so on, uh, the fitness center. But you have to have an underpinning it, it, to keep it, it to keep it healthy. And and I, I don't know that I've I've been as successful as I would have liked to have been uh, in terms of that sort of advocacy. Um, and some of it's just a philosophical difference. Uh, obviously, I'm, I got a vested interest in that. I, I I would love to see that supported in certain ways, and others see that as more of an enterprise area, one that should be making money and showing a net. Um, I understand that in some areas, but but in this context, in this community, a uh, golf course being a great example. If this golf course were even located 40 miles to the north, just slightly south of Buffalo, it would be a gold mine. It's not. It's located where there aren't enough golfers, and there's still plenty of golf courses around. So it's a struggle to to make this golf course show up on the net. It's not anybody's fault. It's just the, you know it's just the reality, and that's why I I, I would say in answer to that question, I, that's an area that that I wasn't really successful in in winning that that argument. But I keep making it. So yeah. while we're talking about this area. Uh, you, we both went through the merger and the uh, accession of this property into Chautauqua, all yes. of which was big community issues. Um, uh, your kids went to Mayville, mine went to Chautauqua, yep. and, and you know, never the twain should ever meet back in those days, yeah. uh, except on sports fields. And you were on the school board. Yeah, I was a member of the charter school board. Uh, so the, I believe it still is the largest candidate pool for any school board election in New York State. I believe there are 36 people running for seven seats for the merged district. Um, and I was uh, fortunate, and I will say I was fortunate. As much work as it was, I, I was fortunate to be one of the seven, and uh, one of only two who had not served on one or the other of the boards. Uh, Jay Baker from the Chautauqua board uh, continued to serve, and from the Mayville board, uh, Randy Henderson, uh, Pam Perdue, uh, Jim Tennis, and uh, Virginia Scriven all all came over from the Mayville board, uh, and then Jill Scott and myself were the were the other seven, <laughs> uh, and and that was that that was an era. It was it was a very interesting thing here at Chautauqua because I'd been elected to the school board, and now you had the notion of building sales, which didn't happen right away. I mean, the merger, actually, we're sitting in the room in which the vote was taken, the second vote uh, in, in the Chautauqua district. First vote went down, uh, passed in Mayville overwhelmingly, uh, and went down in Chautauqua. And there was a, a stipulation in the law that allowed for a community to bring the vote back one more time if they voted down. Mayville did not have to vote again, but Chautauqua had the opportunity, they got enough the signatures on a petition, put it back on the ballot, and it was voted on a second time. It was Valentine's Day, 1996, I believe, the Valentine's Day Massacre, some people called it, uh, and the, the swing was 14 people. The vote was 20, 27 uh, more in favor uh, than not, so it was really just 14 people changed that election. Uh, and I, I, I had been asked for no particular reason. I, this was obviously prior to running for the school board because there wasn't a merged district yet. Uh, but I'd been asked, I guess, just as a community person, to be one of the, uh, I don't know, ballot watchers, or I, if there, there's some, some term for that, but to just sit and check names and, and do the sort of uh, uh, policing of it. And there, was, there were four or five of us. So I sat right, literally right here. And, uh, and at the end of the evening, as we tallied the votes and they were verified and so on, and, and we made the announcement. There were people bursting into tears, sobbing, screaming. There were people hugging and cheering and, and laughing. It was a bizarre and and uh, memorable evening. Uh, and at that point, I think I, I decided that I had a somewhat unique perspective that might be helpful because I worked at Chautauqua and I lived in Mayville. I lived in the Mayville, the Mayville district. And uh, as it turned out. I think it was helpful, but it was tricky when the institution and the school board negotiated this 
so I'm sitting at school board meetings and constantly having to be removed from our own executive sessions when we're talking about the negotiations. Uh, Jay Baker, our president of the board, was doing most of the negotiations with, with Dan Bratton and, and, and others I'm sure were in the room, but, but largely it was the two of them. And, uh, and they developed a, a lifelong friendship. I mean, Jay and I were with Dan just days before he passed away. Um, it was a very special thing, I know, for Jay, as it was for me, obviously. But, um, but it was, uh, it, it was a, a, a time that uh, uh, I thought the need would be to, to sort of settle things, you know, and, and it's something that I guess by nature I'm, I'm a compromise guy. I'm a find the find the path to get us get us to, to a solution here, and and you could just see the rancor, and and so it was an interesting sort of challenge that I thought I'd try. And the public, I, I suppose that was one of the names people knew because I'd been somewhat active in the community, and and. Uh, but I, I ran once more. I did six years, and then some of my colleagues stayed on. Many of them stayed on. I, I chose to leave after two terms. That was enough, I, and I felt it was time for someone else to do it. Uh, and I was, I was beat. I mean, I gave it, it, it a lot of time because you had to. If you're going to do it, I mean, we, we had 50 facility committee meetings in one year before that, that building was built, literally every, every week. And... And that's in addition to the regular school board meetings and the budget hearings and so on. I mean, I think that one year, it was somewhere around 80 or 85 evening meetings. Well, that's, that's a lot of commitment. That, and, um, but uh, uh, we're, I mean, that was, uh, that was a formative time, I think, for everybody involved. And, and it's changed this community. And it changed Chautauqua. And we're sitting in part of that. Uh, the opera facility across the street, of course. and, and uh, uh, I still, we started uh, shortly after the merger, we started a liaison committee, a formal committee between the institution and, and I still sit on that. <laughs> so how, how many years is that? 1996? Yikes. Um, and we just met the other day and there's some exciting uh, new things uh, through, uh, actually through some arts possibilities that uh, Deborah Moore, who's Marty's new assistant, has some connections through the Kennedy Center and there's some very exciting things that are possible. Uh, 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 because of the partnership, I, I, I treasure that. If Chautauqua came to you and said, Jack, we want to name a building after you, <laughs> what building would you select? I, I, I tell them, forget it. You know. <laughs> um, uh, oh, that's a, there's, a, there's a question. Um, the bathrooms at the bell tower for the beach. <laughs> that would that would be that would be one of the choices. Yeah. You heard about those probably more than I, most. I heard about those. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The bathrooms at boys and girls. Actually, a number of bathrooms would be probably because uh, we did we did do a fair amount of work trying to find bathrooms that worked around here. Um, uh, yeah, the tennis courts would really call a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, you know, I, I don't want a building named. Uh, you know, I I I hope that. Uh, that my uh, my time here will be seen as one uh, of uh, of growth in areas that I think form the fabric of a community part of this place. Uh, they're, they're bedrock stuff. They're not they're not glitzy. They're not they're not things that are so unusual to Chautauqua, but but they're grounded, and that's uh, that's what makes this a community and not just a summer place where people come and go. Uh, and that's why I think they've always been so valuable. So, um, so maybe a piece of turf somewhere. I don't know. Charlie, what's the question we should be asking? We're missing it. Well, I was going to say, just following up on what Jack just said, that uh, you asked me, Chautauqua seems to have been more rapidly changing in, pick a time period, the yeah. last 10 years. The houses are getting bigger, the, the, the yeah. people are changing, the atmosphere is changing. Is it, and Greg asked me straight out, is it changing for the better in your view? Is it? You know, I, I, I wouldn't say that it's changing for the better I, 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 because I, I, I can't judge where it's going to be 20 years from now. It certainly is different. It certainly is changing. And again, I, I worry about the impact of the of the increasing number of shorter term visitors, which is the nature of the place, and it's been happening for a long time. Um, and 
and, the, and therefore the importance of these programs that still knit those people together. Because it's always been the case of people, not everybody was here all, all summer, well, it's been that way for a long time, but I think the shorter it gets and if we're not paying attention to ways to knit people together through things like special studies classes or youth programs or recreation, I mean obviously I'm biased here, but those programs are the things that, that make, make those human connections. That's what keeps this place alive and, and, and wonderful. Um, it's always been about relationships. It's a summer camp for Pete's sakes. That's what summer camps are. It's about building relationships. So, I mean, we, we see that at the golf course. I mean, people that, that just want to, they just want to meet up with their friends that they've been playing golf with for a while and, and they may not be great golfers, but they're having a good time and, and they, they value that, you know, that moment. You didn't ask me about the golf course. I mean, well, I'm just going to say we have a few minutes. My tape, but it was. Uh, <laughs> if I'm the golf, the Re Golf Digest magazine, and you're you're celebrating your hundredth anniversary, give us a thumbnail of the history of the golf course. Uh, sure. Uh, actually, we're working on a book, uh, which is not a thumbnail. Uh, Dave Turnbull, who's uh, been a historian of the golf course for some time, is uh, in fact I meet with Dave again tomorrow afternoon to, to work through edits. I'm serving as editor. He's author and I'm editor. We're fighting it out. Um, it, the golf course history is really a, 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 a snapshot of Chautauqua's history. I mean, there are photographs that show social gatherings up there with, with Tom and Mina Edison and Henry Ford standing in front of the clubhouse. They hosted a dinner for the governor of New York in 1936. Who that? Anybody know who that would have been? Mm -hmm. Land, yeah. Landon? No. 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 He was yeah, yeah, yeah. Dewey. Dewey. Yeah, well, anyway. Wait, yeah, maybe. Uh, who knows? Uh, the founders of the club included Arthur Bester, president of the institution. This wasn't just like over there. This was an integral part of the institution. Melville Dewey was one of the founders of the golf club, invented the Dewey Decimal System. Uh, Charles Welch. While playing golf? While playing golf, yeah. yeah. He, was, he was a brilliant <laughs> librarian and not a bad golfer. Um, uh, Charles Welch of Welch Foods in, in Westfield, one of the founders. Uh, the Norton family involved uh, as, as founders of the golf course. So the, the history is, is, is connected. And, and there have been legends. At, we were talking before uh, around the baseball uh, uh, history and, and legends. Uh, you want to talk about legends, you know, Sam Snead played exhibitions at this golf course, still owns the record for the most uh, PGA victories. Uh, Gene Sarazen uh, uh, played there, one of only five golfers to ever win all four of the, the major tournaments. Uh, Horton Smith, the first winner of the Masters, played that, that golf course. Uh, and it wasn't just Amelia Earhart who landed an airplane here, but, and I'm going to forget their names, the two, this is a quiz, if anybody knows this I'd be impressed, the, the two men were the first to fly over the North Pole from, uh, uh, from North America to Europe, also landed uh, the year before Amelia Earhart on the same hole, the <laughs> hole uh, which is now uh, 17 on the lake course, the one that uh, you know goes away from Route 394 and goes up the hill. They would come across the lake and then taxi and stop at the foot of the hill there, at the foot of the green, what's now the green. Um, I mean, that's a, that's a history nobody else has, really. Uh, and the exhibition matches, Dave has done a great job of actually sort of recounting all of them. It's really a fun, uh, it's a fun part of the book. So, uh, yeah, the, it, it's really, a, it's part of Chautauqua's history. The story of, of Ralph, the Egyptian statue, uh, is tied in to, if, if those of you who don't know, there was an Egyptian statue discovered uh, somewhat by chance in the, in the early 80s. Uh, in the in the main gate in the old trolley station uh, there at the main gate in a closet it's 1100 pounds uh, black carved black granite it's 3,000 years old had been given to the institution in 1981 to the museum here by the Egypt Exploration Society of London who knows why but but uh, and it and it sat there apparently for a long time with nobody knowing th that it was there until someone discovered it and uh, it, it sold at, at uh, Sotheby's auction house for $343,000. The money was put into a capital, sort of a revolving capital fund that was to be used for uh, enterprise type projects that could generate revenue and thus, in, in quotes, pay back 
a loan to that fund, and then it could be used again. The bookstore was a beneficiary, as was the golf course mm -hmm. when the second 18 was built. That's where the seed money came from to build the second 18 was from. And Ralph, he got the name Ralph from a, a young Fredonia student who was, who was working here and who did a lot of the legwork in trying to figure out who the heck Ralph was. Uh, she nicknamed him Ralph. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and they did. They, they searched it out, going to all sorts of Egyptologists and um, and they, they definitely know who this person was. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very special history. It's a very special history. What's the result of it? You're going to have a book? Mm -hmm. It's going to be... Yeah, yeah. There will be, uh, there will be a book. Uh, with any luck, there will be a book by, by the season. Uh, it's a big job to put a book together. Uh, uh, Dave's done a great job of, of writing. I'm trying to get it, you know, in a form that uh, uh, is, is concise enough and readable enough and and uh, we're adding the pictures now because there's a lot of great photos, not as many as we'd like. Actually, Stan Marshall was dragged out of, of the fire in 1976, I think, is when the, the clubhouse burnt down, uh, the old clubhouse, the colonial-style clubhouse. And uh, Stan, the story goes, Stan got up there, and uh, the... the uh, uh, the, the people were trying to get stuff out of the clubhouse, and they were carrying furniture. And he said, we can replace the furniture. But the whole inside of the clubhouse is filled with these old historic photos of, of Gene Sarazen and Sam Snead, Ben Hogan, Walter Hagen. They're all in there. So he started running around and gathered up the photos, and we still have them, thanks to that, that little bit of effort. Uh, and, and many of those will be reproduced in the book. So, yeah, it should be available by, by the summer. Uh, we'll put them at the bookstore. And, uh, I, I, I just hope to sell enough to get the money back that we're investing in doing the book. But it's a great, it'll be a great treasure for the, for the golf course, a good permanent part of, of uh, our, our record. So We even have a mannequin dressed up in knickers up in the pro shop right now. It's a flat hat, yeah. knickers, argyle. Yeah. So yeah. you're paint Stewart look-alike? Yeah, yeah <laughs> sort, sort of. And I, I have committed to uh, wearing knickers to a number of the uh, member tournaments this summer. So if you really want to see something scary, you can come see that. <laughs> What's the Jack Volker legacy? Well, I, th I, think, I think we've, we've recounted it. It's, it's, the, it's the point A to point B process over the last 27 years. I, I love going to the family entertainment series and knowing that, that I sort of made that up. Uh, I started it in Smith Wilkes Hall, hiring some people that I used to hire in Westfield, uh, folk singers, kids, performers, and we used to charge a dollar at the door. And I, I would stand there and take the dollar bills from people, stuff them in my pocket, the absolute truth. I'd walk backstage and I'd count them out and I'd pay the performer hoping that I had enough to pay them the 200 bucks or 150 bucks or whatever they were charging me to do the performance. We've come a long way since then, and now, of course, there's some of the amp. And, and, uh, but uh, but I, I think that's, that's one thing I'm proud of because it, it spoke to a, an obvious need in the community, and we started it so, so modestly, and it, and it, it took hold. Uh, young Readers Program, certainly, uh, because I, I know the stories that parents have related about kids who've who've learned and loved, to, you know, learned to love reading more as a result of being exposed to some of those books and programs. Uh, and, you know, you, the, the whole, the whole I'm, I'm, I'm particularly proud of that, that whole club transition as well because of what condition it was before. I think that's, that's something that... Uh, you know, it's, it's funny, Jake, the day of that fire, some of us were working in the department and carrying stuff around. What's, a, what's, what's your best Charlie Hyde story? Oh. Best Charlie Hyde story? Just how easy and smooth and... Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, how, how we always saw eye to eye. Uh, we have absolutely identical political views. <laughs> we can't, we probably can't get any farther apart on, on that side. That's probably my, that's probably my best story. How, how could, uh, you know, two people be such good friends and colleagues over the years and be so diametrically opposed? Yeah. <laughs> we don't talk about it. We don't talk about it, yeah. But we have, we have so many other things in common that, that, that we do fine, so yeah. Well, one of the things you do have in common is both of you guys have had a tremendous uh, effect on Chautauqua Institution, and it's, it's much better because of both of you. And so, Jack, thank you for coming to share this. You're welcome. Good luck.
I, I apologize for the, the gravelly voice. It's as my kids always said. Uh, whenever I got a little laryngitis, I've got a classic end of the winter cold. Uh, it was my my uh, uh, penance for for loving to talk so much because they they they, they usually use the joke that uh, yeah, Dad, it'll take you 15 minutes to introduce yourself. You know, they start you know walking around yawning, but that's kids.